You know, after the blunders this guy has made, you'd think he'd have the good sense to just stay politely dead. I mean, how bad is it when you make a video with a title like The Worst Bible Doctrines, and then go on to say that you don't actually think the Bible teaches anti-Semitism where you cited it? Anyone with any sense would just pull the dirt over themselves and take a nice long nap after that kind of admission. Can someone please turn on the zombie translator for us? Thanks. Yeah, this is the kind of old-fashioned stupid funny atheists are known for. Look, I know about that point of view. It's not like I don't. I compared and contrasted that view with Sloyan's, and with the evidence, and consulted several commentaries, and I decided his view is the better one. And I assume funny atheists are supposed to be freethinkers who will tell you that you're not supposed to accept a view just because it's the majority view. Make no mistake, France Bond and the rest are respected scholars. But all they're doing is repeating the argument that Sloyan refutes, and that doesn't counter it. Sloyan's argument is based on two things. First, the parallels in the Bible to the phrase, which everyone agrees on. Second, the fact that it's a tit-for-tat response to Pilate equivalent to his own. It's that second part that's the crux, especially the tit-for-tat part. Where France gets it wrong is pretty straightforward. He doesn't see the exchange between Pilate and the crowd as a type of honor challenge situation. Each side is professing innocence in a tug-of-war over who gets responsibility. That's also where Bond gets it wrong. Pilate's not showing any hesitation whatsoever. He's taunting the crowd as part of that exchange. Why the traditional position is wrong isn't hard to see. For the crowd commissioned by the priest to accept the responsibility that Pilate dropped would have been ridiculous. That was the very thing the high priests were trying to avoid in the first place. That's what turns the blood be on us reply from being a straightforward acceptance of responsibility as it is elsewhere in the Bible, into a sarcastic or ironic rejoinder. It's a lot like the situation recorded in Josephus' Jewish War where Pilate introduced Roman standards to Jerusalem, and a crowd of Jews came to protest. Pilate responded by surrounding them with troops and threatening to cut them down unless they stopped objecting to the standards. The Jews reply by flinging themselves to the ground and baring their necks as though offering themselves for execution. Now, can you really imagine that pious Jews who express that kind of sentiment would say to Rome, Yes, we'll take responsibility for the death of a man you condemned and are punishing justly and fairly according to Roman law? That's just ridiculous. And that would be true even if the crowd wasn't commissioned by the priest. Their response has to be a tit-for-tat because otherwise it's politically and socially nonsensical. Now get this straight. We both agree that this probably wasn't part of a formal judicial procedure. It was a show trial. So everyone knows darn well that Pilate could wash his hands in acid and it wouldn't make him any less responsible for sending Jesus to his death. Nor can the priests make themselves any less responsible for their role. Both Pilate and the priests were doing exactly what they were supposed to do under Roman law. So the real purpose of all this back and forth can't be for shifting of judicial or actual responsibility. What was the purpose of it, then? Well, there's only two reasonable options. One is that the Jewish leaders wanted to avoid a popular backlash, while Pilate wanted them to face that popular backlash. The other is that this was basically nothing but agonistic theater. Put in modern language, it was a pissing contest. Either way, it's ridiculous to see this passage as the crowd taking literal or legal responsibility for the death of Jesus. No one's actually shifting the legal burden of guilt, because it can't be evaded. <laughs> Uh, effectively, that's what I'm saying they did when they countered Pilate's hand-washing with their response of innocence. 
Ain't no one else there to take the responsibility. But let me explain why that's a stupid argument anyway. Let's say I said something like this in a vid. Now you know that if I ever did, I'd be expressing that sentiment sarcastically, and that I really mean he's a lousy Bible scholar. But some idiot could take that statement in isolation and say back, quote, if he had really wanted to say that Number One Son was a lousy Bible scholar, he would have said Number One Son was a lousy Bible scholar. See? It goes nowhere. His argument is typical fundy. He thinks only a literal profession could say it the right way to say something. Oh, so now he's so screwed on Matthew 27:25, he wants to bring in other passages. All right, let's teach him another lesson. At the time of the Passover festival when Jesus was crucified, there were tens of thousands or even as many as a million Jews in Jerusalem. Now maybe, just maybe, he might have enough brains to agree that Luke isn't saying that Herod and Pilate met with every one of those people. So what would a passage like this really mean? Well, in a collectivist society, your identity came from your leadership. So, for example, when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, he obviously doesn't mean that he himself, Paul, has been physically crucified. It means that he shares Jesus' identity in a collective way. So, in a positional sense, he was on the cross with Jesus. It's only in that very narrow representational sense that passages like Acts 4.27 blame everyone else in Jerusalem for Jesus' death. Because their leaders were there meeting with Pilate and Herod, representing the body of the people of Israel. If you think about it, we sometimes do the same sort of thing today, though the most popular manifestation is negative rather than positive. And as individualists, most of us are pretty quick to disassociate ourselves from leaders we voted for after they do stupid or unpopular things. Bottom line is, it's not the sort of blame he thinks it is. And it's also countered by the fact that warnings like that one, in public preaching, were followed by calls for repentance and a recognition that Jesus had risen from the dead thereby effectively negating the official verdict of execution and disassociating themselves with the leadership. Now think about it. If they could do that, were the apostles really saying that the Jews as a whole were literally guilty of the death of Jesus in the way that he's arguing? No, because a simple disassociation in that case wouldn't absolve them of the crime. One other thing. He appeals to Sloyan's point that Matthew 27:25 was also meant to explain the bloodshed in the Jewish war. Well, sorry, I don't date Matthew any later than 60 AD, and don't see any reason to think Matthew is just theological. He's going to have to deal with a lot more of my material if he wants to play that game. Uh, good grief. That's not what Sloyan says. He doesn't say it's used as a witness invocation, and he doesn't say it's used as an oath. I know it's a judicial warning of responsibility. I even say so in my original vid on this. What Sloyan says is that the witness uses that invocation, the invocation by the judges, as a proof of his innocence. Maybe next time little number one son had better think a little harder. He was asking all those Talmudic scholars the wrong question because he didn't understand Sloyan's point. Kind of a waste of time, wasn't it? Yeah, great, so his blunder extended all the way back to his original video on the subject. I'm not surprised. No, that's the sort of thing a fundy would do, not me. But I'll give him credit. At least he admits he should have been more precise with the terminology. That much he gets right. Uh, no, it doesn't for a couple of reasons. First of all, as he's as much as admitted, the odds are that this wasn't a formal trial. So they weren't under oath and Jesus' execution was already a foregone conclusion. But even if this was a formal legal proceeding, and even if all of what the tractate reports on this was applied in the first century, 
What it warns about is conjecture, hearsay, and secondhand testimony. Not being honestly mistaken. And that's all I say these people were as a whole. You can be sure a lot of them heard Jesus' teaching in the temple and agreed that he was a blasphemer. So I wouldn't see any reason to doubt that most of them had an honestly mistaken belief that Jesus was actually a false prophet and a blasphemer. In fact, by the time of Matthew 27:25, that he had been arrested would have been taken as prime evidence that he was a false prophet. You can also be sure that the mob of temple workers had people in it who knew firsthand how Jesus had done that wrecking ball business in the temple. Bottom line, as far as they were concerned, I see no reason to think that their testimony was intentionally false. Uh, yeah, look, aside from what I just said about this not being a formal trial, I said that in specific response to his point that members of the mob lied and used false teachings in Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin. So my point was that these temple functionaries would be willing to accept the word of the priestly leadership about their motives and behavior, including during the Sanhedrin trial. That doesn't mean I think that they'd accept hearsay evidence from the priests and use it in their testimony. And besides all that, he's advancing a false premise anyway. That crowd didn't actually testify to anything factual. Other than that, they agreed Jesus was deserving of death, which was undoubtedly them telling the truth. So even if they were fed tons of hearsay and pressured like a car in a crusher, which I see no reason to believe, they still didn't do anything that Tractate Sanhedrin 37A disallowed. Yeah, well, that doesn't change the fact of the dynamics here. The idea that this was mainly a mob of fickle citizens is a pretty stupid one. A person who was upset by Jesus' failures wasn't any more likely to do favors for the powers like Rome and the priests that were oppressing them. There also wasn't enough time to assemble such a crowd for Pilate, especially in the wee hours of the morning. But there was more than enough time to call out a roster of temple workers who were right there on the job. That's why that's where the evidence takes us, not to fickle citizens. Uh, wait a minute. He admits multiple times that he wasn't as precise as he should have been with the terminology, and that when he referred to the mob, he was including the priestly leadership. So, even if he's showing us a picture of the high priest, doesn't that mean he is saying the mob turned Jesus over? You know what really makes it hard to argue with this guy? Knowing what position he'll take at any given moment. He's done more flip-flops than the governor of Florida on Medicaid expansion. Well, yeah, sorry he's so stupid and all, but that's what they were, and that's the role Pilate pulled them into in that show trial. Pilate asked them what evil Jesus had done, and they answered that he deserves to be crucified. That's the same as saying we believe and testify that he did something worthy of death. Sounds like exactly what a witness is supposed to do. Yeah, I know they were part of the gallery, that's my point. Pilate asked them a question you'd ask a witness. That it was part of his plan to irritate his political rivals, not because he was following Roman law. Hey, uh, newsflash. The truth isn't changed just because people suffer because of an untruth. Like I said the first time, if people in the past misread Matthew 27:25, that just means he's as stupid as they are. That also doesn't make the results any less tragic. But in the end, whatever that passage means isn't affected by anything that happened later on. If it robs him of one of his favorite arguments, too bad. He needs to let it go. Let's make this simple. Anti-Semitism didn't start after Matthew 27:25. And if Matthew 27:25 or the whole New Testament didn't exist, then anti-Semites would find ammo somewhere else. Even some Nazis thought the Old Testament was a great text to use in support of their anti-Semitism. So what's number one son going to do? Blame the Jews for writing the Old Testament? In the end, this thing where you blame an object or a text rather than an acting person is a symptom of a highly childish mindset which attempts to evade personal responsibility for actions by fixing blame on someone or something else that allegedly inspired the deed. 
There are modern parallels to this, like a story of how a teenager claimed that he was inspired by the movie Halloween to kill his mother. The film doesn't say, go out and kill your mother, any more than Matthew 27:25 says, go out and kill and persecute Jews who lived hundreds of years after the fact. The real question is, did the film and the text cause the act, or was it simply misused to affirm a predisposition that was already there? Somehow, given the fact that Number One Son is a movie fan, I don't think he's throwing out all the movies in his house or saying we ought to bring the producers of Halloween up on charges of accessory to murder. Because by the kind of logic he's using, that's where it all leads. Well, I guess that's another burial done, but you know how these guys are. You can bury them dead and they'll pop up again and claim they're still winning. The only question is, what cockamamie scheme will they come up with to frame their supposed victory? I'll be back for part three. Curse you holding!